感谢主办方邀请我分享我对上海金融中心未来的看法。我会说中文一点点，所以我现在用我的中文。啊，哎，不要用这个，谢谢你。好，明白。啊，上海已经是金融中心，啊，但是金正十分积累。我从二零零年，啊、呃，我每个月来上海，我看到了上海的变化，我也看到了其他的金融中心的发展，所以今天我从我的经验来分享，请我允许啊、呃，我用英语现在做我的演讲，谢谢。So the presentation that I hope that I will give this afternoon builds on everything that has been said uh, in, since this morning. Um, let's just start with a map of the financial centers around the world. Um, as uh, Michael Waddle just said, um, his organization uh, looks at about 121, 122 uh, financial centers around the world, or centers that claim to be financial centers around the world. So we looked at all of them and, and we sort of um, divided them into global centers, uh, topical centers, uh, and, and regional centers. So big, uh, medium, and small. The big ones are easy to identify and recognize. London, New York, uh, they have a strong and long history. Uh, They've got very deep uh, domestic markets. Um, and in the case of the UK, uh, it had uh, a worldwide uh, colonial uh, legacy to build on uh, and become a global financial center. And also, they benefited from geopolitical uh, changes uh, that happens dramatically from time to time. But my favorite financial center of all times is a small little island in between the UK and the US called Bermuda. It, has an, uh, it is an island that has no reason to be a financial center, but it, uh, it, it houses 1,100 insurance companies carrying $1.6 trillion in assets um, and writing about $268 billion in premiums every year. And why is that the case? Because Bermuda leverages its position uh, between Europe and the US and leverages all of the rules, the laws, uh, and the expectations uh, that exist in each of these markets. And so it is what we call in the financial center terms a booking center. If you go to Bermuda today, it's got no more a population than 70,000 people. It cannot take more people. It's a, a closed island. Uh, every household has to generate its own fresh water, regardless of whether you are rich or poor, uh, and it cannot grow the population anymore. Uh, and the most important business in um, Bermuda are the custodians uh, and the accountants. So it's companies like KPMG, uh, which are large uh, and dominant uh, in Bermuda. And almost none of the insurance companies that are domiciled in, in, in Bermuda uh, actually have people working in Bermuda. So let's have that at the back of our minds uh, as we discuss this topic of uh, global financial centers. Uh, in the East Asia region, of course, uh, you have Tokyo and then down to Hong Kong uh, and Singapore. Uh, and in that context, uh, we want to be able to discuss um, Shanghai. Uh, and its own future as a financial center. Now, this is uh, from Michael's own uh, uh, criteria uh, from which the Global Financial uh, Center Index is developed. And as Michael had said, uh, there are five different criteria: uh, business environment, human capital, infrastructure, uh, and financial sector development, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and all of the uh, developments taking place. I can't see it from where I am. Um, of all the factors that he's uh, mentioned, um, the one that is most interesting is uh, business environment. Um, the many different 
jurisdictions have to do something that is specific uh, to create a business environment that is global, that is internationally recognizable, that is transposable, uh, but at the same time, not lose touch uh, of their domestic needs uh, and uh, limitations. So I think about Dubai, uh, which uh, has two jurisdictions, one for its offshore uh, financial center and one for financial institutions who do business onshore. Um, the DIFC has a very uh, different legal infrastructure and uh, the court structure to support uh, its offshore financial center regime. Uh, and that's something that I think uh, China and Shanghai should think a lot more about. Um, the UK's English-speaking common law theme uh, seem to be uh, the most important underlining uh, ruling jurisdiction or infrastructure uh, that is uh, the basis of many of the most successful financial centers around the world. Um, and uh, many centers have to bifurcate between uh, what they need to achieve domestically on a cultural terms, on cultural terms, uh, and then still be seen as a global financial center. Now, this is the ranking as it exists right now. New York and London uh, being top on the list is not uh, surprising, but Singapore, uh, the third uh, most uh, important fi financial, global financial center, and I come from Singapore, um, and I've had the privilege of uh, serving in two government uh, subcommittees, as they would call them, where uh, the government of Singapore mobilizes the private sector to uh, give it ideas in terms of how uh, it can respond to new challenges uh, and start to build a vision of what the country should look like in the future. And the two committees that I served in, one was in 20, 2001, uh, and that was just a few years after the Asian financial crisis, and another was in 2010. Um, and they put CEOs of various different types of organizations, including banks, um, and go round the table and ask us, uh, what is it that we need to do uh, to be a successful financial center? Um, and I remember vividly uh, the conversations that we had in the second um, session that I was part of. We went round the, the room and came to the conclusion that, that the two areas that Singapore should focus on uh, would be risk management and wealth management. And that was in 2010. And the state, use the rest of that period from 2010 to today to build those two infrastructures in terms of skill sets, in terms of legal infrastructure, in terms of financial promotion, um, and uh, going out to the market uh, and getting as many private banks to be domiciled uh, in Singapore. And then came the inflection points. The inflection points are the points in history where something happens that works in your favor. So in the area of private banking, for example, uh, for example, the Ukraine-Russian war um, sends a lot of uh, private banking clients uh, scouring around the world looking for financial centers to, to be domiciled. Um, but at the same time, in the area of risk management, building up the risk management infrastructure and with greater KYC uh, requirements by uh, legislators around the world, uh, Singapore became uh, uh, a skill set uh, dom uh, center for risk management, uh, which then fed into uh, the corporate treasury business. So that's how I saw Singapore rise in the ranks. And another area in which Singapore rise, rose in the rank uh, is actually seen uh, in this uh, listing of what makes uh, the different financial centers uh, and gives them their profile. So. When you look at this uh, listing of the different financial centers alongside each other, there are a few things that we can see. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is that, except for maybe London and New York, which are very deep financial centers, the centers that do well in equity tend not to do well in bond markets. Actually, they scurry to build uh, bond markets. And I remember this conversation that I've had both in Singapore and in Hong Kong. How do we build a domestic bond market? How do we build a bench line 
uh, indicators or indices uh, for the bond markets. And of course, as you can see from uh, the chart, China is a natural bond market because it issues its own domestic bonds. You've got a whole range of issuers from provincial governments to um, state-owned enterprises and so on. Um, and then you have uh, Japan, which is a very interesting bond market because it is domiciled and its investors are entirely, almost entirely domestic. So when a rating agency rewrites uh, the Japanese uh, index or indices for, for its bond markets, it doesn't cause a ripple uh, because um, it is entirely domestic. Um, and the big competition between Singapore and Hong Kong uh, is like this. Hong Kong's equity market is four times the size of Singapore. Uh, and so there is no way in the world that Singapore will be able to match that. Uh, and it has a, a momentum all of its own. Um, where Singapore took uh, a lead against Hong Kong is in the FX market. And that, the story of how that evolved is a very interesting one. Uh, for a very long time, Japan was the FX market for this time zone uh, and one of the top three in the world. Now, you will not see this in this chart, but the FX rankings will actually show that Singapore is now number three, if I'm not mistaken, um, global FX center. Um, and the reason for that was very simple. They managed to get all the English-speaking youth who had moved to Japan to move instead to Singapore. For more than 10 years, uh, Japan was a global FX center very simply because um, undereducated English-speaking youth from countries like the UK, Australia, New Zealand would congregate into Japan, get jobs as traders, uh, and then build the FX market. Um, but Japan did not give them long-term visas, uh, and uh, Singapore slowly solved that problem, and eventually they gravitated towards Singapore, uh, and that created the critical mass from which Singapore then uh, stole market share uh, from a country like Japan. Um, Shanghai obviously has competition not just from abroad, but from other jurisdictions within China, in commodities, in gold, uh, in, um, in FX. Uh, the, Shanghai has about 20% or 20 to 25% of market share, but it's a battle that you continue to fight. And it's good that there's competition within the country uh, because that ensures that there is uh, continued innovation uh, and continued uh, progress and, and the creation of um, market share uh, over a period of time. Uh, and we need to see that Shanghai is integrated not just with the rest of the world, but with the rest of the country. You know, going back to the theme of the inflection point, just think about this that Shanghai was not originally slated to be uh, the financial center. The origins of banking in the Chinese, with Chinese characteristics comes from Shanxi. Uh, and for a long time, the most important um, bankers in China were Shanxi people. Uh, Shanghai's uh, moment came uh, because of the opium wars and because of the opening up of China and the advent of foreign banks uh, that chose to be domiciled in Shanghai instead. And that was uh, where the rise of Shanghai took place. And like, like this part of the history, looking into the future, we need to look for inflection points that will create uh, a breakthrough from where new market share can be developed. Um, so I want to end my, uh, my, my presentation by making some very simple points, okay? And the, the purpose of my presentation is to give life to this topic so that we talk about it uh, in a creative and open manner and not just look at the numbers for what they are. The story of financial centers is the story of people who like to meet with each other. Um, Michael said, the coffee culture in London. Actually, it's the bar culture uh, in many different countries. You, you want to see a good financial center, look for the bar street uh, around that financial center and see how alive it is. That's where the deals are made. Uh, the other criteria today that is increasingly important is the relationship between the state uh, and free enterprise. Um, 
in many jurisdictions, the state is becoming an important player. The state runs all of the financial innovation and marketing activities, uh, but it needs to give space for free enterprise to create uh, the new future. And we don't know which of the asset classes will become important in the future. We've had uh, discussed fin fintech, for example, financial technology, but also uh, blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, and so on. Um, and we, it is not clear as yet uh, which of these will form new asset classes which is open for any one of the major financial centers to grab uh, and to create critical mass and to dominate and to um, be the financial center of the future. Um, and uh, I think I've sort of covered all of the points uh, quite clearly, and I hope that this gives you food for thought. Thank you.非常感谢李李先生刚才从国际视野对我们未来这个开放性的城市尤其他也讲到伦敦的咖啡文化现在上海已经成为全球真正的咖啡城市因为咖啡吧子全球占比最多的世界上已经排名了这相信这些咖啡文化对我们未来金融中心建设也是有